Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'll be predicting the main card fights for Bellator 199, Beta vs. King Mo. Without further ado, let's get into the first fight of the night. So, in our first fight of the night, we have Aaron Pico vs. Lee Morrison in the featherweight division. And Aaron Pico, is all, as we know, or may or may not know, is one of the huge stars, our potential prospect stars that Bellator is trying to build up. They brought him from the wrestling realm. He has some amateur boxing background as well. Definitely uh, like amateur wrestling standout. Like Phenom, as far as that go, Young and all that stuff. Brought him in his first fight. He got upset. Then he went on to have two pretty respectable like performances that show he still has that prospects and all that potential and where they know he can be or where they for so, for saying that he could be in the division in the sport. He's been looking flit, like flashy. His wrestling has been looking good. Striking has been looking good and it's getting better. And he's only three fights in. He had one loss on that record, but those wins have kind of made you kind of at least forget. That first debut loss a bit. And also he dropped weight. So he's not really having to deal with that size issue anymore. His confidence is getting better. And I think this guy, Lee Morrison, certainly a, a, a veteran of the sport. But I don't think at this point, they both bring, are bringing him in still to kind of build up Aaron Pico slow. They're not going to try to rush him in against the very best just yet. So they're trying to give him these good people with a lot of experience. But maybe people who aren't really that upper echelon yet. But they had experience, but not that... um. Those accolades yet. So it's, it's definitely a build-up fight. So I think in this fight, Lee Morrison is a respectable fighter, but I feel like Aaron Pico will be have all the advantage. He has the size advantage, has the speed advantage, the power advantage, the wrestling advantage, the grappling advantage, age advantage. And I think that's all going to play out in this fight. I think Lee Morrison is going to give him a... Just what the um, Bellator kind of wants him to give him, they want to give him a little bit of a challenge. And then Aaron Pico, once he figured him, figures him out, I think within the first two minutes, he's probably going to start taking the fight wherever he wants it to go for the first after, through the first round. And then to finish him, i say within the first two minutes of the second round, and it'll be a, another good performance for Aaron Pico. And he'll continue to get better. And they'll continue to slowly build him up until they feel that he can really truly challenge in the weight class. So in this fight, I have Aaron Pico via second round TKL. Then in our next fight, we have in the, in the lightweight division, Adam Piccolotti versus Carrington Banks. So Adam Piccolotti is a, certainly a... Very respectable fighter. He has he's pretty much dangerous everywhere. He has good submissions, decent grappling, decent wrestling offense, pretty respectable striking. And Karen Banks is a black zillion. I think he was on a black zillion versus um American top team season and stuff that was on in the UFC. And did, I think he he was one of the only fighters on that season that didn't lose. I think he didn't have a loss in the house on that, that ultimate fighter season. But it, they didn't for that reason, I don't think they didn't renew him or give him a contract for that reason. I don't know why, but it is what it is, and he's still undefeated 7-0. So in this fight, all respect to Adam Piccolotti, but I think the wrestling pressure and um, pretty much this if Cameron Banks is going to keep it smart on the feet, he's going to acknowledge that maybe he doesn't have the striking advantage or might be giving away the striking advantage, but I feel that his wrestling, his forward pressure and the wrestling pressure will be too much, and he'll be able to grind out a decision over Adam Piccolotti, and Cameron Banks will win in his typical fashion. Maybe a gritty, but he'll win in a clear-cut three-round decision. So in this fight, I have Cameron Banks be a decision. Then our next fight, we have in heavyweight division, Shet Congo versus Javi Ayala. So Shet Congo, you already know what he does. His striking is solid, but defense is not the best. Sometimes he doesn't make the best decisions, whether it be on the feet or on the ground. And Javi Ayala, he has um he has a weird frame, but he, despite all his mass and maybe the, his figure, he's very light on his feet. Has some pr pretty solid power. He's pr pretty fast, but his, his wrestling takedown defense isn't the best. His grappling takedown isn't the best, but I think his submission defense is pretty respectable. His takedown defense, as far as um, how he defends against grappling, isn't the best. Like he gives up, he'll give up ground and stuff. If somebody starts trying to wrestle him, he'll slow down his pace a little bit. People start wrestling, and you can hold him on the ground a lot and, and take off a lot of time. And that's what, just what Shaq Hong is going to try to do. If he could, Shaq Hong can avoid getting caught by any of uh, Javi Ayala's like speed and his punches because or his awkwardness because he's so big and has such a frame. But he's so fast and he avoid getting caught by any of these punches or kicks or anything like that. I feel like Chicago will be able to do what Chicago does and pose as well. As a matter of fact, it's not like the first time Chicago fought somebody like this. Or he fought like a better version of Javi Allen when Matt Merchion. Pretty much the same thing. A big fighter. Matt Merchion's frame is better. It's not as awkward. Matt Merchion's faster. He has more power. And he was able to do similar to things that um, Matt Merchion in the past. He was able to smother him like he does. Hold him against the cage. Take him down. Avoid really getting into any striking or getting caught with too much power or stuff that will cause him to potentially lose again in TKO or knocked out. Smother him a little bit. Then when he gets him in his cage, hug on him, take him down, beat on him. 
And I feel that's what Shaq Khan is going to do. Allah's going to certainly have his moments, and I think the on-the-feet is definitely his best opportunity. But I feel that Shaq Khan will use, will use his veteran experience. You know, he's, despite him getting older, I think he's like 41 or 40-plus. I think he'll still be able to do his, his same old strategy against fighters like this. He'll be able to smother them, take them down, beat them on for three rounds. Won't get a finish, but we'll be able to clearly win a three-round decision with a couple little scares here and there. So in this fight, I have Chet Congo be a three-round decision. Then into our cold main event, cold main event, we have in the welterweight division, John Fitch versus Paul Daly. Two certain, like, two definite veterans. Definitely John Fitch was in the UFC for a minute, was... Pretty much the boogeyman of the welterweight division as far as laying and praying on people. Nobody wanted that that work. Nobody wanted him to fight him. He was on this huge winning streak and never got that rematch with GSP. So you know who John Fitch is. Paul Daly, certainly solid fighter. Despite him seeming like he's very one-dimensional, he's still a pretty decent, well-rounded fighter. But he certainly needs to work on that grappling, grappling aspect. Well, at this point, I don't think it's ever going to really get that much better. Sometimes it looks decent. Sometimes it holds up. Sometimes it, it doesn't. That's just the reality with Paul Daly. I think that's going to be the case with this John Fish fight. John Fish is respectable on the feet, but we definitely, you definitely get a, the striking advantage to Paul Daly. It's pretty much going to be like a play out, like a, in my opinion, like a striker versus grappling matchup. And pretty much probably like how, how most of Paul Daly's losses look. John Fish is going to be respectable on the feet, but if he really wants to win and doesn't get caught or dropped by anything, John Fish is going to really just try to go for the takedown and he's going to turn into a grappler this matchup. And Paul Daly, just by being Paul Daly, he might be able to defend one takedown, might even tr- land the takedown, but it really not. He's not going to be taking down John Fitch with that much frequency. He might get one takedown this off, surprise, the surprise aspect, and won't be able to hold it. It's going to be a striker versus grapple match. John Fitch going to be going for takedowns, trying to hold on him. I don't think he'll be able to get a submission on Paul Daly, but he'll certainly be trying to take him down, use his ground to pound, and just hold him down for three rounds. And Paul Daly is going to be trying to use any little bit of opportunity, any little bit of space to try to land a big punch or a big head kick or anything, big body kick, some type of big punch to finish some type of significant strike to put take John Fitch out of the fight. But I feel like that strategy is kind of, it's definitely d- really dead now. He's you're, you're working on trying to get like a one lucky shot or something versus somebody who just, once they get you down, that's just a wrap. Like you're basically playing cat versus mouse, like a little cat or whatever, a little Ricky Ticky Tabby or whatever the case is. What type of strategy is that? When you're trying to land one shot versus somebody just trying to, Pretty much try to land one shot. That's never really a good strategy in anything, whether in boxing, kickboxing, anything, or like basketball. You're trying to get one little lucky three pointer or something. It's really not the best, like going for these Hail Mary type of stuff. It's not the best strategy. If he could sprawl and defend John Fitch, it would be a good strategy. Then he could just impose his striking on him, impose his will on him, kind of try to break John Fitch. But I don't really feel that he'll be able to break John Fitch or defend his takedowns to that much frequency that his striking will be able to be that effective. So I feel that John Fitch will be able to take him down round and round. It might be, in total in this fight, this fight might be on the feet for two minutes maximum throughout the whole three-round fight. So, this fight, John Fitch, be a clear-cut three-round decision. Old-school, lay-and-pray, John Fitch style. So, in this fight, let me say it again, John Fitch by, via three-round decision. So, now to our main event, we have in the heavyweight division. Well, yeah, heavyweight division. I forget, keep getting because he's both light heavyweight fighters for sure, but it's a heavyweight tournament, so it's at the heavyweight. So, confuse them, but yeah. In the heavyweight division, Ryan Bader versus Muhammad Lawal or King Mo, as he calls himself. This fight, King Mo is certainly the respectful fight. You can't get disrespect him. A lot of people probably will disrespect him and act like he's not on this level or he's not this caliber because he's never been in UFC. King Mo certainly was, in my opinion, one of a really big talent at one point or even at this point. He just never ever made it to the UFC or chose to never come to UFC. And he had some setbacks here and there and some decisions that could have went his way but didn't. So King Mo, certainly, there's a lot of respect you gotta give him despite... Well, you might kind of not like see or you might try to overlook or say ah, this and that because he didn't fight here, he didn't fight that, blah, blah, blah. He lost Rampage and this and that. But you got to get perspective to King Mo. King Mo has pretty solid box. I would say it's the best. It's certainly like take it back. I don't, think his, I don't feel his defense is the best even though he tries to think it is. I think his um, footwork is kind of sloppy a little bit. He's too flat-footed. He could blame like himself slipping on the mat all the time, but really it's because he's so flat-footed and his feet be dragging and stuff instead of being on his toes at any point. It's always like he's flat-footed, but he has a lot of power. I say him and Ron Bader have comparable power. They certainly have heavyweight power. Their power is significant. I feel that Ron Bader is faster. Overall, he mixes it up more, but King Mo is timing just a little better with his strikes. Takedowns, about even. Wrestling, you probably say in a real wrestling match, Muhammad Wall or King Mo have the, the wrestling advantage. But as far as it may, I feel like Ryan Bader has a wrestling advantage because over that long period of time, 15 minutes of fighting, Ryan Bader could keep the same pace the whole fight. Whereas King Mo, if you defend a couple of his takedowns or even if he's success, like, I'm stuttering, successfully landing his takedowns, 
you could feel visibly see him getting tired. I'm sure the opponent could feel him getting tired. He can't really hold up that wrestling pace, especially against top level competition for three rounds. It, it fades and he starts visibly getting labor, like start laboring. And his his striking starts to get worse. His defense gets worse. His takedowns, um, um, accuracy goes down. All his stats go down over time. I feel like Ryan Bader will be able to at least keep the same pace the whole fight. But King Mo's pretty much will be, I don't think he'll win this fight via wrestling. Definitely not. Only way King Mo will win this fight is if he will be able to be a landing big shot, catch Ryan Bader. And one thing they could give him King Mo, he certainly goes for the fight. The, like He's in the fight the whole time unless you take him out. He's not going to be somebody that's going to like Ryan Bader. If he gets hit by a big punch or somebody's intimidating him, he's going to crack. King Mo's going to be in the fight the whole time. You certainly got you got to take him out of the fight. With Ryan Bader, if he probably get hit by the same punch that King Mo might get hit by him, Ryan Bader will probably either get curl up and get TKO'd or... Really, just kind of quit with Kimo. He's not. If, no matter how how hard you hit him, it, you don't put him out. He's gonna keep fighting. That's pretty much kind of the difference. So you gotta give them their little different respects. But in this fight, just to not go too much off the topic or try to get too much into it, dinking and stuff. I feel like Ryan Bader is real key to this fight. That Ryan Bader will be able to push the same pace of fight, and Kimo will slow down. Kimo might have his moments early or his chances early, but throughout the fight, I feel like Kimo just gonna fade. Ryan Bader's gonna probably fill him out. He's gonna understand this notice from saying this fights. He's going to try to pretty much try to break him. He's going to have a competitive first round with him, I see. And then through the second and third, I feel that King Mo will start to slow down. Ryan Bader will keep the same pace, see him getting weaker, see him getting slower, pick up the pace, and then go for the finish. I feel that uh, Ryan Bader will have an early third round finish over King Mo via TKO. So in this fight, in our main event, I had Ryan Bader via third round TKO over Muhammad Lawal. And that concludes my five predictions for Bellator 199, Beta versus King Mo. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, and come back for more videos. Peace.